Han har ryggen was born 60 years after William Morris. Both of them were pioneers on textile arts and crafts and both were equally socially and politically engaged. Uh, William Morris, uh, 1834 to 1896, was an English designer that believed that everybody has a right to a beautiful house. He was also a poet, a novelist, and a translator, and a social activist. Associated with the British arts, uh, arts and crafts movement, he was a major contributor to the revival of traditional British textile art and methods of produ production. His literary, literary contributions helped establish uh, the modern fantasy genre, which he played a significant role in propagating the early socialist movement in Britain. Uh, I'm... Uh, Karen Kramer was a curator at the William Morris Gallery from 2008 to 2017. She worked on the award-winning uh, redisplay in the 2012 in 2012 and co-authored the guidebook William Morris in 50 Objects. She now works as a curator for the National Trust in London and the South East. Welcome so much, Karen. Karen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh no, here we go. I do not want art for a few, any more than education for a few, or freedom for a few. I love this quote. I think uh, you'll find few people today who would disagree with this sentiment. But Morris wrote it in 1877. And this was his rallying cry for equality and for the importance of art to be available for everyone, not just a privileged few. So how far have we come to achieve this? In 2013, the artist Jeremy Deller asked the same question. He had been invited to represent Britain at the Venice Biennale. And uh, the previous year, he had also been to Venice, but, uh, you know, as a visitor. And he had witnessed a bit of a controversy uh, because a very wealthy and well-known art collector has m had moored his yacht right outside the entrance to the Biennale, blocking the view for everyone else and having the security guards remove people from the pavement. So this caused quite a bit of upset. And Della saw this not as an isolated incident, but as a symptom of an increasingly distorted art world dominated by extreme wealth. So for his show, Deller included this mural and he summoned William Morris, rising from the Venice Lagoon, to throw away the yacht. Now why pick Morris? Why pick a 19th century designer best known for his wallpapers and his textile patterns uh, as a champion for the arts? And in this talk, I hope to show you why Morris is perfect for this role. William Morris looms large in the history of design in Britain. He was a designer whose patterns of wallpapers and textiles are still being made and produced and sold all over the world. Uh, he uh, revived ancient craft techniques and brought them back into his factories, uh, his factory, his workshop. Um, he um, campaigned to preserve historical buildings. He was a socialist, a poet, a writer, a printer of fine books, and of course a businessman. Um, and I will address these various aspects of Morris's work in my talk, but it's important to understand how they all come together. Uh, to understand Morris, you have to realize that he rebelled against the age. He rejected the society he lived in, and he tried to create a better society, first through art and then through politics. And as he looked back on this in later in life, he summed it up himself, saying, with the arrogance of youth, I tried to transform the world with beauty. I need to get better at this. Right. Um, here we've got Morris. Um, oh, right. OK, so let's start at the beginning. Morris was born in 1834 in Walthamstow, which was then, uh, well, it's part of London, but um, it was very rural Essex countryside. Uh, his father was a broker, an investment banker, if you like. 
And although he died when Morris was only 13 years old, uh, he had invested in a Devon copper mine and made an absolute fortune. And so after his death, it's the income from these shares that very much sustained the family. So they were, you know, um, wealthy middle class. They were relatively well off. This is uh, Morris's childhood home, which is now the William Morris Gallery. So that gives you a good indication of the family's wealth. Uh, and I guess Morris had more freedom than most to choose his path. But his background was very conventional. There was nothing artistic about the family. In fact, he was supposed to go into the church, which was a very respectable career for a man of his social background at that time. And his mother invested in expensive education, sending him aged 13, first to boarding school at Marlborough College and then to Oxford University. Um, so, you know, there was a certain amount of expectation on his shoulders. He was the eldest son. His father had died. So when he gets to Oxford, things develop very differently. Morris reads Ruskin and is deeply inspired by his critique of art and modern civilization, which of course resonates with his own instinctive appreciation of the medieval past. This is Ruskin's drawing of Rouen Cathedral, and it really shows you what he admires about the, the building, the craftsmanship, um, the detail. Um, in medieval sculpture, Ruskin detected signs of the life and liberty of every workman who struck the stone. And he contrasts this with what he saw in England, the wage slavery of industrial labor and its soulless and ugly products. So Ruskin links the state of art with the state of society. And Morris was later to do the same. So this interpretation by Ruskin very much struck a chord with Morris. Uh, and in later life, he publishes Ruskin's chapter on the nature of Gothic, which you see il illustrated here, um, you know, claiming that in future days it will be considered as one of the very few necessary and inevitable utterances of the 19th century. But Ruskin isn't the only influence. Morris meets Edward Byrne-Jones at the university and he becomes a lifelong friend. Uh, and they share a circle of friends and they have similar interests. Uh, they love literature, so they read Mallory and the tales of King Arthur. Uh, they love the poetry of Milton and Tennyson. They read the social critiques as well of Thomas Carlyle and discover the pre-Raphaelites. Um, and Morris and Byrne-Jones travel to northern France together to visit Gothic cathedrals and they decide there and then to devote their life to art. So how do you then become an artist? Um, Morris never has any formal art training. Uh, he tries first to become an architect and has, serves, a, serves a short apprenticeships with G.E. Street, the architect, uh, but it doesn't really suit him and he soon leaves. He moves back to London and uh, lives in rooms with Edward Byrne-Jones and he very much starts to just experiment with a wide range of arts. So he writes poetry, he designs and paints furniture, um, he becomes interested in embroidery. He also starts to draw, and this is an early self-portrait from that time. Um, it's worth noting that Morris and Byrne Jones at this time are very much under the influence of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the pre-Raphaelite painter who they you know, absolutely adore and um, who is a very strong influence on them. He's, you know, he's, he's older, he's very charismatic, um, and he draws them in uh, and very much encouraged them to, to draw because Rossetti believed that anybody could draw and Morris certainly gives it a good go. <laughs> so these are two very rare examples of Morris, uh, you know, figure drawings by Morris from that early period. They're both of Jane, Mor uh, Jane Burden, as she is then. Uh, they later marry. Um, they meet in Oxford when she agrees to model for Morris and his friends. And Morris is very struck by her unusual beauty and uh, falls in love and they later get married. But these are rare because Morris, um, despite Rossetti's encouragement, never really feels that confident about his drawing. You know, he's much more naturally drawn to pattern, uh, pattern with words. He's writing a lot of poetry at that time. But also look at the beautiful detailed lining of the sleeve here where his eye is drawn. After Morris and Jane get married, they go and live at Red House. Um, 
you must visit Red House if you're ever in the UK. Um, he commissions this house to be built by Philip Webb. Uh, it's uh, it's a friend who he meets during his short apprenticeship with GE Street. So this is another one of these lifelong friendships. And um, this is uh, Webb's first commission. Um, it's very much Morris's dream house. It's very medieval in character, as you can see. Um, Morris himself described it as medieval in spirit, and Rossetti famously referred to it as more a poem than a house. Uh, this is also where the two daughters are born, Je uh, Jenny and May. Jenny is the eldest. Uh, she has a lot of academic promise as a child, but uh, has epilepsy, which at that time means that uh, later in life she becomes pretty much housebound. Uh, it's a very sad story that causes a lot of pain in the family. May, the youngest daughter, follows in her father's footsteps and becomes an artist in her own right. Uh, now, the period at Red House is highly significant, so let's take a closer look inside. Part of the romance of Red House was the interior, as you can see here. So instead of going out and buying their furnishings, this group of friends get together and they make it. They paint the walls, they paint furniture, paint tiles, um, they make embroidered hangings, you name it. And... Um, what I'll show you here is that today Red House is uh, owned and managed by the National Trust and recent conservation has revealed that the interior scheme was even more extensive than previously thought. Um, at some point after the Morris family le left, the walls were painted white, but rather wonderfully beneath this white paint, Morris's original scheme survives. Um, and I find it really interesting because when you think of an arts and crafts home today, it's that very dominant image of a of, of white painted, fairly minimalist approach. Uh, Morris had something very different going on at Red House, uh, crazy medieval fantasy. And, you know, be really inter interesting to see how this uh, how this unfolds. Now, it was the experience of decorating Red House that gave Morris and his friends the confidence to set up their interior design business. And Morris Marshall Faulkner & Co. is established in 1861. The early products of the firm were similar in style to the ones you would have seen at Red House. So sometimes they were directly inspired, such as this. This is Morris's very first wallpaper design, trellis. And it was inspired by the gardens at Red House. Uh, where they had the trellis fences in the garden. Um, and you can see within this uh, design that Morris is already looking at different colorways, different colored squares behind it. But this is also that early period of experiment. He's not that confident about his drawing yet. So he asks Philip Webb to draw in the birds for him. So even this design is a collaboration. This is another example of one of the early products of the firm. The design is by Morris and it takes its inspiration from various sources. So for example, stylized bird is something that he's seen in an illuminated manuscript in the British Museum. Uh, and the phrase is taken from Chaucer, who is a lifelong influence on Morris. But I show it here as well to tell you something about Morris's approach to design. Morris believed that you could only design for, um, for, for an, an object um, if you understood the technique um, so for embroidery, uh, he uh, in his bachelor pad, where he lives with Edward Byrne Jones, he sets up an embroidery frame and he gets the housekeeper to show him how to do stitches. Uh, and then after he gets married, he and Jane share that interest and together they buy and unpick old embroideries together to learn about different stitching techniques. Um, and this is really essential because Morris believed that only if you understand the possibilities and the limitations of both the material and the technique can you appropriately design for it. Uh, but of course, once he has that understanding, he's quite happy to just design for it and let somebody else do the making. In this case, the, the stitching is, is done by Jane with at least two other people. Um, so again, it's a, a collaborative effort. Um, and that's what these early products were for the firm. They were collaborative, they were intensely medieval, and they were non-commercial. Morris Marshall Faulkner & Co. was set up in 1861, and the early part, 
partners are uh, the painters Ford Maddox Brown, Rossetti, Burne Jones, Morris, of course, himself, the architect Philip Webb, uh, the engineer Marshall, and the mathematician Charles Faulkner. Now, before we look at their designs, um, let's discuss what they wanted to achieve. As you can see from this quote, Morris believed that people needed beauty in their life, like you might need, you know, air or water. Uh, you needed to stimulate the imagination, to lift the spirit. I cannot allow that it is good for any hour of the day to be stripped of life and beauty. And the decorative arts can bring that, they can do that. They can bring furnishings designed by artists, made by craftsmen with the best materials. Um, and this was very much a reaction against the Victorian age. Industrialization had resulted in slum housing, poor working conditions and pollution. Factories produced endless varieties of cheaply made mass produced goods with little care for design or quality. And Morris and his friends hate this poor quality. They hate the waste of resources gone into making them and they want to elevate the decorative arts. So this shows you what Morris and his friends were up against. Uh, what you see on the left is a mid-19th century wallpaper, beautifully produced, made in France. Uh, Morris would have objected to this um, wholeheartedly. Oh, no, no, no. I was doing so well. Right. Um, oh, it's not great and large, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of detail. Um, so what would he have objected to? Well, first of all, um, he wouldn't have liked the colours. He probably would have thought that they were too garish. He preferred a much more natural colour palette. Um, he didn't like the suggestion of three dimensionality. He said for a flat wall, you need to design a flat pattern. And he wouldn't have liked the realistic depiction of the flowers. Morris says, what's the point? You might as well stick some flowers on the wall. So instead, he wants a pattern that's inspired by nature, but with a degree of abstraction. He wants a pattern that is restful and at the same time stimulates your imagination and makes you think of something beyond itself. And if we're very serious about this, uh, Rossetti is invited to a lady's home, a potential commission, and she innocently asks him, well, you know, can you make some recommendations for my house? And Rossetti replies, I would start by burning everything you've got. <laughs> and Morris is no different. He later says, I have never been to a rich man's house which would not look better for having nine-tenths of all of it burned. So do away with all this clutter in your house. Think about what you have in there. Is it useful? Is it beautiful? So how do they go about achieving this vision, this ambition to change um, the state of decorative art in Britain? Uh, well, they have a, make, have a few early commissions in which they really make their name. This is the Green Dining Room at the Victorian Albert Museum. You can still see it today. And if you do, don't be distracted by the horrible modern furniture that's in there now. Um, when the uh, v is built, uh, Morris and his friends are asked to decorate one of the dining rooms. And this is the new design museum, you know. So this for a young group of designers, it's quite a coup to get the commission. And it places them right at the heart of the avant-garde. On the other end of the scale, they get a commission at St. James's Palace, which is probably as establishment as it's going to get. And uh, Morris later goes back several times to decorate other parts and create furnishings for the palace. This is St. James's wallpaper um, designed by Morris. It's the largest repeat pattern he ever produced. And that's because it was for a very large wall. It was the staircase at the palace. Uh, it's also very expensive to make. It took 68 wood blocks to print this. Um, so you can imagine the cost of that. But then there's a clever marketing trick there as well, because after they make it for the palace, they then sell it in their shop, calling it the St. James's pattern. So you could see how that might attract a certain public. Another um, source of income for the firm in those early years are, is stained glass. It's pretty much their mainstay in, in, in the early years of the firm. And that's because there are a lot of churches being built and being renovated in England at that time. And again, this group of designers steps into that market and they get a strong reputation for the quality of their stained glass. 
Um, and that's because you've got painters like Ford Maddox Brown, Burne Jones, Rossetti, but also Webb and Morris all designing stained glass. But then Morris very much overviewing the the, the making, the, the production process, and having that real eye for color that makes the quality of the products come alive. Now, by 1875, Morris reorganizes the firm under his sole directorship. He buys out the other partners. Where the other partners had, you know, uh, different sources of income, they were painters, they were architects. Uh, for Morris, this was pretty much it. He had a young family. He would spent most of his inheritance on Red House. So he had to make this business a success. And he has a number of very shrewd business managers who help him develop the business. And what they do is they start to cater for the middle classes. Because not everybody can afford to have their whole house or a whole room decorated by Morris & Co. But people might like to buy a few tiles for their fireplace. They open a shop on Oxford Street. Um, they have a range of uh, furniture, stock furniture. These are the Sussex chairs on the right, become hugely popular. Um, and, you know... Um, very typical of the of a Morris interior. Um, now, interestingly, most of the furniture for the firm was designed by Philip Webb, who was the architect of Red House. And uh, Morris believed in two different types of furniture. You had workaday furniture, so that's an example seen here. So you know, very lightweight, could go with with the in any interior, easy to use. And then he believed in statement pieces. And this is an illustration of Kelmscott House, Morris's own uh, London home. And uh, what you see on the left there is uh, just the edge of the settle that he had. Morris & Co. sold this settle as well in, um, in their shop. And although you could buy a customized version if you wanted something a bit more elaborate, but you can see it's, it's, it's a statement piece. It's very medieval in character. Uh, it also doesn't look very comfortable, does it? <laughs> there used to be a cushion at the back as well, but Morris famously said, if you want to be comfortable, go to bed. <laughs> I include this slide to make the point that Morris wasn't the only designer, the pattern designer for the firm. Uh, his daughter, May, uh, played a very important role. By the age of 23, she ran the embroidery section for the firm, and that wasn't in a management business, that was as chief designer. Um, and this is the honeysuckle pattern that she designed, uh, which is one of Morris & Co's most popular patterns. Um, and on the right, you see a daffodil designed by Henry Durrell. Durrell is interesting as well. He starts working for Morris as an apprentice, as a tapestry apprentice, and works his way up to become Morris's right-hand man. He uh, he's, a ta he's also a pattern designer and uh, designed several of the firm's designs, but these were always sold under the Morris & Co banner. You know, they always played up on that name, and it's only um, in in recent, more recent years, well, <laughs> mid twentieth century, it depends on your perspective, I guess, um, that these these narratives have been um, unravelled. Now, the shop catered for different types of customers. So, for example, if you were on a bit of a budget, you might like to buy an embroidery kit, such as this one here. It's designed by Mae Morris and really showing off her skill as a designer. Uh, and then you just would buy the backing fabric um, and the silks and make something like this at home. Now, if you were a bit more ambitious, this is the Batty embroidery. It, it measures about um, just under two by three meters, slightly smaller than what you see here. Um, absolutely impressive. Um, but this was designed by May for one particular client. So it's a very personal commission. It's a one off. And so May includes the family's coat of arms and all these quirky medievalist sayings in the design. Uh, but then the lady of the house made this herself at home. Um, I'd love to know how long it took her. Um, this, interestingly, it wasn't even the only embroidery that she bought from Morris & Co. to make at home. She was clearly a hugely talented needlewoman in her own right. Uh, 
uh, before before we do that, um, the last thing to point out is that uh, despite you know this range of goods that were available via the shop, Morris continued with all his major commissions as well, where he would come in and design a whole room, and you know the firms would make the products. One of these commissions uh, was Round and Range, a house in Yorkshire, uh, which was owned by Sir Isaac Lothian Bell, who was you know had made a fortune. Um, and he, um, so he asked Morris to come back and decorate different parts of the room. So she's a really good customer. And it's this customer who finds Morris one morning storming through his house. And when he asks him what's the matter, Morris replies, I spend my life ministering to the swinish luxuries of the rich. He says it, you know, the man takes it in good humor. <laughs> But it's really an indication that Morris is getting increasingly uncomfortable in these very wealthy homes when his own political outlook is very different. And when you get to the 1880s, um, he leaves most of the design and the liaising with customers to, to his uh, right-hand man, Henry Durrell, because he's deeply involved with the socialist struggle in England at that time. But more about that later. I also want to make the point that Morris & Co. is an international business in Morris's own lifetime. He has agents in Europe and in America. He sends his business manager over to a Boston trade fair. Um, and there's a wonderful letter in the galleries collection, which uh, is from Jane. And she's uh, writing to a friend in America saying, you know, our, our business manager is coming over. Can you make some introductions? And I think that's really interesting because she's always portrayed as, you know, the model, the pre-Raphaelite model. Uh, but this is still a family business and she played a part. Now the firm stained glass was ordered by churches in Canada, South Africa, India, Europe, the States. Um, as far as I know, not any churches in Norway, do tell me if I'm wrong, uh, but this window on the left now is in Oslo, uh, in the National Museum for Decorative Art. It's a recent acquisition, but the other patterns you see there were actually bought, uh, bought for the museum in, um, in 1894 uh, in Germany. And, you know, it's not the only museum, national museum to do that. There are European museums are buying Morris & Co's fabrics at that time as indicative of of an English style, which I think, you know, it's really interesting to think about how these patterns became better known and how they were viewed by others. And of course, these patterns <laughs> continue to be made. These are some, um, yeah, it's poor quality, sorry, I got them from the website from the firm who sells them now, Walker Greenbank, a huge company, bought up Sanderson's, who always produced Morris & Co's wallpapers anyway. And this is their latest range. Uh, range sorry. Um, I include it here because, you know, I think it's really interesting to see how the patterns have developed over time. And, you know, they move in and out of fashions, the colours change, they're adapted. And, you know, it'd be interesting to think what Morris would have thought of that. Okay, let's return to William Morris and uh, discuss his role as a manufacturer. Morris was a hands-on craftsman. He refused to introduce any technique into his workshops until he fully understood the process himself. And here we have Morris in his smock. Uh, he placed an extraordinary amount of energy and time into ensuring the quality of the products. But it's not just about the quality of the products. It's also about the quality of work. For Morris, work is essential. He believed that everybody had a creative impulse and should be able to use that in their work. And once they do, and the working conditions are right, people will experience the natural pleasure of work. And this idea that work is essential and naturally pleasurable leads us to the most radical of Morris's ideas, his assertion that all work done with pleasure is art. Now let's start by looking at how Morris worked himself. What was his creative process? When you look at sources of inspiration, Morris took these from different um, different angles. He always looked to nature for inspiration. Um, so, you know, you see that time and time again in his patterns. He uh, was inspired by the medieval, as we have seen. He also was very interested in Indian fabrics, uh, bearing in mind that, you know, uh, Britain at the heart of empire, these were readily available in London. And he's, uh, he's often visits the South Kensington Museum as well to, to, to study historical fabrics. 
um, working with a dyer up in league to very understand how they're constructed and how natural dyes are used. Um, now, to understand Morris's creative process, you also have to understand that he's a complete workaholic. He had this tremendous energy. So, for example, in the 1870s, when he is busiest with the firm, he also has a, has a young family. Um, he's experimenting with natural dyes, designing, opening a shop in Oxford Street. He writes poetry, uh, lectures about art across the country. And in his spare time, as a hobby, he's learning Icelandic because he loves the saga so much that he wants to appreciate them in his own in their own language. And with the help of an Icelandic scholar, starts to translate them all into English. <clears throat> Morris was also a great multitasker. And as you can see from this quote, it could be quite disparaging about people who didn't share this talent. So I think here he creates a category of one person for only for himself. But there you go. His life unfolds in cycles. Morris becomes passionately interested in something, learns all about it, creates a huge body of work. And then after a few years, when he achieves what he wanted to achieve, he something else takes his interest and he's quite happy to move on. And this is how he gets involved in such a range of arts by absorbing these experiences, this language, the knowledge um, and, and the knowledge in his hands. He then casts this into a new form. So, for example, let's look at his interest in tapestry. Tapestry was the textile art he most admired. He remembered as a young man seeing medieval tapestries on display and recalled the sense of romance they gave him. We know he, he learned about a technique from examining medieval tapestries in London's museums. He read, reads 18th century manuals on the subject. He goes to the Victorian Albert Museum to see medieval examples. And where you and I might look at those and think, wow, I could never do that. Morris thinks, let's give it a go. Um, so in 1879, he sets up a loom in his bedroom and after some experiment, starts to weave a tapestry. Um, this is the finished result. <laughs> Four months later, he even kept a di diary during this time to chart his progress. And he's not at all happy with this result. Uh, he originally called the design a Countess and Vine, but then renames it Cabbage and Vine because, <laughs> you know... You can see that he, due to his inexperience, the tension has distorted the design rather a lot. But he doesn't let that, you know, dissuade him. Uh, and soon after, he sets up looms in his workshops. He hires experienced weavers and apprentices, and they start to make Morris & Co. tapestries. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this story because it's another um, example of Morris wanting to understand the technique before he designed for it. Morris uses a hoteless loom in, uh, in his workshop, an upright loom where the weaver works with the back, uh, sh watching the back of the tapestry and then looking through a mirror at the front. This is obviously a publicity photograph. We, all, we do know who this is. This is Douglas Griffiths, who was a, a tapestry apprentice for Morris & Co. Um, and like anywhere else, apprentices would, um, you know, slowly learn their trade, working with the weavers and making trial pieces such as this one uh, that Douglas made. Um, Morris also encouraged his apprentices to go to art school in the evenings. This is an example of a completed tapestry. It's designed by Morris in 1885, and it's inspired by a tale from Ovid's Metamorphosis that tells of King Picus, who, um, when he refuses the advances of the sorceress Circe, uh, she turns him into a woodpecker. And, you know, that's where Morris gets his design from. And you can see that his own poetry is embroidered onto the, um, onto the tapestry itself. It reads, I once a king and chief, now am the tree bark's thief, ever twixt trunk and leaf chasing the prey. Um, this is a very unusual tapestry because it's designed only by Morris. Usually with his tapestries, he worked with Edward Byrne Jones. For example... This is the Adoration, the most popular church uh, tapestry. I think uh, for the firm, about 10 were woven. Um, 
And the figures are by Byrne Jones, uh, and the flowers you can see in the front are designed by Henry Durrell. Morris's role was to discuss the subject with the client, visit the location, advise on colors, and make sure that the design would not be overpowered by the stained glass. Uh, it took three weavers two years to make. Now, How large is it? Sorry? How large is it? Oh, uh, I I think it's again, it's similar to the Batty embroidery, about two by three, just under. As a manufacturer of tapestry, Morris's greatest advantage over competitors was the choice of Byrne Jones as, as chief designer. His figurative designs, made at a time when his own reputation as an artist was becoming widely recognized, helped establish the firm's reputation. And in terms of process, Burn Jones would draw the figures very small, it's about this size. So they used a rel relatively new technique of photography to enlarge those designs to scale. And if you look carefully, Morris, uh, sorry, Burn Jones has gone over it again with pencil and with whitewash. And these amended photographic cartoons are the ones that were used by the weavers uh, in the workshops. Now, the time doesn't allow me to discuss each of the crafts Morris was involved in. There's just too many. I have discussed tapestry as a point of comparison with the next talk, uh, but I will also discuss block printing, as this is the craft Morris is most famously associated with. This photograph illustrates the process. You see the block printer standing at a table where the cloth is stretched out over it. They have a little trolley with a die pad on it, so they stamp the wood block on the die pad, stamp it on the cloth. So you can see what a repetitive job that must have been, but highly skillful because the blocks have to, you know, line up perfectly. Otherwise, the pattern doesn't make any sense. So how, how, where did it start? It starts with a design. On the left, you have Morris's design for Metway. Uh, the original design. He always worked on a single piece of paper. He didn't believe in neat copies, so he would just work it up. Uh, it may be a bit difficult to see from this photograph, but the design is squared up to guide the design. Um, and then it's partially colored to show the, um, the people in the workshops what the final results should look like. Um, now, Morris and co draftsmen then take that original design and they work out how the blocks needed to be cut. So some patterns, you need something like 35 wood blocks. Um, so, you know, highly skilled job again. And then, oh God, I can't see that very well. But um, on the right is a design for a wood block. So they would drive draw those up and those woodblock designs would have been sent to a specialist firm where they would cut the woodblocks by hand like so and I think these are beautiful works of art in their own right they're beautifully detailed uh, some of them have got very fine lines so they used metal inserts or if there were really big areas of color they used felt on top of them um, they're carved from fruit wood because it's soft and easier to carve and then on the right, you see the result, the metway pattern. Uh, now, these are just some photographs of other examples of work in Morris's workshop. Uh, by 1880, he always had his workshop in uh, near near his shop in London. But by 1881, there is such a demand for his products that he needs a bigger site. And he rents a set of workshops in Merton Abbey in South London. Uh, they're quite a rural in, in appearance, um, but there's a lot going on. So you have, uh, they make their own dyes, natural dyes, Morris was very particular about. Um, there was carpet knotting, which was usually done by women. And um, weaving, the jacket looms. Interestingly, people always think that Morris was completely anti-technology. That's not the case, but he didn't want people to become slaves of technology. Uh, in his own workshop, if he could have afforded it, he would probably have bought power-operated jacquard looms. Uh, because the key thing with Morris is that if you are going to use that kind of technique, just design for it. So, for example, some of his um, carpet designs are made by power-operated looms by other firms. Uh, he just didn't have the, the kind of resource to buy that kind of equipment. And he said, what's the difference, whether it's the, the hand that pushes the shuttle through or it's steam power. But the key difference is you need to design appropriately for it.
Now, by discussing tapestry weaving and block printing, I hope I've shown the attention to detail Morris shows to selecting the right materials, finding the right method and working with craftsmen. But it will also be clear to you that these were not the most efficient or the cheapest ways of working. We know Morris was frustrated that his products weren't um, affordable for most people, but he was never willing to compromise on quality. If something wasn't well made, it simply wasn't worth making. Now, three things happen in the 1870s that give, that give the impetus for his increasingly radical outlook. The first was the trip he made to Iceland. Now, Morris was not a keen traveller, but Iceland had a very special place in his imaginations because he, he loved the saga so much. So he goes there twice, and this is not just a couple of you know days in Reykjavik. This is crisscrossed the country on a pony, um, and uh, Burne Jones made these rather cheeky cartoons of Morris's adventures there. And this is Morris's own um, Kelmscott Press edition of one of the sagas. Um, Morris, when he travels through Iceland, the life of the people he meets there make a huge impression on him. Uh, craft was still widely practiced, uh, the tradition of oral storytelling was very much alive, and he felt that people lived in much closer sympathy with the natural environment. Now, Morris wasn't naive. He could see that life in such a harsh environment was often challenging, but there wasn't a huge divide, he saw it, um, between the rich and the poor, as he saw in England. And this, this to him really, uh, really rang true. And he writes to one of his friends after the trip, saying the most grinding poverty is a trifly, trifling evil compared to the inequality of the classes. So Iceland was the first in the 1870s that change started to change Morris's outlook. The second is uh, the restoration of ancient buildings. Um, now, in the Victorian age, if you owned a building, of course, you could pretty much do with it what you wanted. And uh, there was a booming industry in restoration. And lots of buildings, churches in particular, were being enlarged and um, improved upon, uh, often with the loss of most uh, much of the historical fabric. Um, this is uh, one example that made Morris particularly angry. It's St. Albans Abbey before the restoration and after. So you can see that the entire West Front was rebuilt in this pseudo-medieval style and Morris would be infuriated by things like this. He felt that it destroyed the integrity of the building, that their history was being lost. And with a group of like-minded friends, he found the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, which was a lobbying group that tried to advocate for a new and less intrusive approach. So, you know, prop up a wall, fix a roof, rather than create some kind of pastiche of an ancient building. And of course, the SPAB is still in uh, existence and influencing um, architecture in, in Britain today. Morris also changed his own business practice to reflect the ethos of the society. He starts refusing commissions for stained glass in old churches. And his involvement with the SPAB was hugely significant because it was the first time he played an active role in public life and he used his fame as a poet and a designer to influence public opinion. The third factor in Morris's changing outlook is his involvement with the Eastern Question Association. So the background to this is um, th that England is allied with Turkey. This is the fallout of the Ottoman Empire. The European powers are starting to uh, compete for taking over and protecting their own spheres of influence. Britain, of course, trying to protect its empire. Uh, and uh, England aligns with uh, Turkey, even though Turkey is being accused of horrendous atrocities in Bulgaria at that time. And a, a war with Russia is on the cards. Um, the liberal opposition la leader, Gladstone, um, starts a campaign uh, against against this possible war and Morris wholeheartedly throws himself into that campaign. He asks people to consider the motives of, of those people arguing for war with Russia. He writes a, a public manifesto called To the Working Men of England in which he, he writes these words. 
So shame, double shame, if you march under such a leadership as this, in an unjust war, against a people who are not our enemies, against Europe, against freedom, against nature, against the hope of the world. So he attends public meetings, he speaks at public meetings, he funds the campaign. Um, but then as nationalism is starting to grow in, this, in the country, as war is coming increasingly closer, um, this anti-war message becomes even more controversial and the liberal politicians are starting to you know, step away from that. It becomes politically inconvenient. And Morris, feel, Morris feels personally betrayed by that. And it very much strengthens his position that thinking that you know maybe change isn't possible through democratic means. Maybe we need something else. By the 1880s, Morris has had enough. All these different elements come together. His frustration that his products can't be bought by uh, normal people, normal people, <laughs> by less wealthy people. Uh, the inequality he sees every day in London, the frustration with Parliament and politicians in general, and his own instinctive reaction of society, which was with him from an early age and was re reinforced through Ruskin's writing and his own experience as an artist and designer. So Morris concludes then that capitalism is the root cause of all these problems and the only way to bring about change is to overthrow the capitalist system upon which his own wealth depended. And once he is convinced that that change is necessary, he does not hold back. In his own words, he crosses the river of fire. He becomes a socialist and pours all that energy, that commitment, his time, his money into fighting for the cause. He becomes an activist. He found, founds and funds uh, several socialist newspapers, uh, one of which called The Commonweal. He writes articles and pamphlets, um, uh, such as you can see here, and he would carry them around in a brown satchel I showed you earlier. Um, both his daughters follow him into, into uh, this new line of interest, um, into the cause, and they go out fly posting at night with him. He goes and speaks on corners. The 1880s were a decade of economic recession and industrial unrest. So these were the years of the match girl strikes, the docker strikes in London. And at times it really seemed like the revolution he hoped for was not far off. In this time, Morris addresses over a thousand meetings, often in the open air, on street corners, in coffee houses, working men's clubs, parks in the East End of London. And this wasn't a comfortable setting of a lecture hall. Uh, street preachers, as, as they were known, were often heckled. There was often violence from the police as well. Mm. Morris was in Trafalgar Square when things got out of control in 1887, an incident that became later known as Bloody Sunday. Now, his own family home in Hammersmith becomes one of the headquarters of the movement. And on Sunday evening, socialists, anarchists, radicals of all persuasions were invited to give lectures in the coach house. Uh, and here are some of Morris, uh, here's Morris with, with his comrades in, uh, in Hammersmith uh, with their banner. Um, you also see Morris's two daughters uh, on the front row. Morris had a fiery temper at the best of times and these were challenging years with lots of political infighting within the socialist movement about the best way to proceed. And in his diaries and lectures, you can hear his frustration, but also his attempts to try and hold the movement together and focus on the bigger picture. Now, what is the bigger picture? Morris describes his ideal in uh, News From Nowhere, a hugely influential utopian novel, um, in which he describes uh, and the narrator wakes up in a post-revolutionary world in which there is no private property, no industrialization, no money, no capitalism. So in this pastoral paradise, all members of society work cooperatively and take pleasure in their labor. Morris writes poetry, songs, and novels uh, about socialism, but not any visual art. Um, but he did inspire others, and this is a good example. We don't know who made this banner, but stylistically it de dates from the uh, late 19th century. It is silk, so obviously for a display in a hall or a meeting room, not so much for taking out on marshes. 
Um, and the embroidered slogan reads, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? Um, this is a phrase we associate with Morris because he used it in his uh, in his book, A Dream of John Ball, uh, a novel about the Peasants' Revolt, a 14th century bloody uprising in England. And the painted scene you see in the middle there is also is is um, is based on the frontispiece of this book that was designed by Edward Burne Jones. No, sorry, too fast. I hope I've given you an, an overview of Morris's involvement in the socialist cause. And this, this was really not the behavior of someone who only plays lip service to a socialist agenda. He didn't sit in his comfortable study and just moralized about what should be. He actively went out and tried to make it happen. And his health deteriorated rapidly from all the outdoor speaking. But during this time, his business continued as usual. Morris taken a step back, but in the hands of his capable staff, you know, they continued. Um, and some of Morris's contemporaries struggled to understand his position. By the 1880s, he was a household name. He was a famous author of The Earthly Paradise, um, an epic poem that was read up and down uh, houses in the, uh, you know, across the country. Uh, and they, of course, knew him for his wallpapers, his fabrics as well. Morris's closest friend, Edward Byrne Jones, was shocked and dismayed by Morris's politics, his conversion to socialism. Um, he, he felt he was uh, abandoning his artistic vocation. As you can see in this quote here, I want Morris back. I want him to write divine books and leave the rest. Now, the press went on the attack as well. They accused Morris of hypocrisy. One journalist described him as a bundle of contradictions, whilst another questioned why he didn't just give all his money to the poor. I think Morris's reply would have been to ask what that would achieve. Would that change anything? Would that bring about change? For the same reason, he doesn't really see the point in campaigning for small improvements to working people's lives. For example, reduced working week. Um, for Morris, this just isn't radical enough. And all it would do is mask uh, the exploitation of working people. He felt the system was rotten. It needed to be removed, uh, root and branch. And he was under no illusion that such a dramatic change would be easy or peaceful. In a letter to a friend, he writes, His flesh, My flesh trembles at what form the revolution may take, though my spirit is willing. So what I hope to have shown is that Morris's social radicalism evolved out of his experience as a designer and a maker, and that the two were inseparable. He was driven by a desire to create a society where art and craft could thrive and be truly democratic. As he said, what business do we have with art at all unless we can share it? Morris dies in 1896 after a period of ill health. Before he dies, however, he visits Norway. In Juli July 1896, he's sent on a health cruise to Norway, um, you know, to the, to the coast. And he was very ill. He didn't enjoy life on board very much. Uh, but the cathedral in Trondheim made, a, made an impression. He wrote home, I saw Trondheim Cathedral, big church, terribly restored. <laughs> but well worth seeing. In fact, as beautiful as can be, it quite touched my heart hard. Morris died a few months later and the doctor comments the cause is simply being William Morris and doing more work than most 10 men. After his death, a new generation of artists and designers take Morris's ideas further. It starts a bit early actually, it starts in the 1880s. Uh, and this has become known as the art and crafts movement, which went on to dominate craft and design in Britain until the First World War. Uh, and it branches out as well, of course, to Europe, to the States and Japan. The art and craft movement was an approach to design and to a process of making. It was a set of ideas rather than a style. And at its core, the movement was based on functional design and on nature as the primary source of pattern. It had a strong social and moral stance, and those who were involved 
were convinced that taking part in design and craft would improve the quality of life. So there is an emphasis on working together, on fellowship and on access for art to all. So you can hear Morris's views echoed in all of this. The Arts and Crafts Movement takes its name from an exhibition society founded in 1887 by the Art Workers Guild, uh, which was a network of artists, uh, architects and designers who uh, used a series of exhibitions and lectures to elevate the status of decorative art. Um, this is the catalogue for the first exhibition, 1888. Um, interestingly, Morris uh, and co-products are very much exhibited there. Morris isn't that keen. He isn't quite convinced this will achieve what it can. Uh, the successor of the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society is known as the Society of Designer Craftsmen, which of course is still active today, as is the Art Workers Guild. But women weren't allowed to join the Art Workers Guild. Uh, women like May Morris, who, as I said, become the head of Morris & Co. Embroidery Department at the age of 23. And by the 1900s, she was teaching embroidery. She'd written a book about embroidery technique. Uh, she lectured extensively, as well as designing and making her own embroideries. Uh, she was very concerned by the lack of professional organizations open to women, so she helped found the Women's Guild of Art in 1907. And the members included some of the most notable figures in the arts and crafts movement. The painter, Evelyn de Morgan, the jeweler, George Gaskin, the bookbinder, Georgie, sorry, <laughs> the bookbinder, Catherine Adams, and the sculptor, Mabel White. Um, May relished the opportunity to, to debate and network with other, uh, the latest artistic trends with other designers. She says in 1910, it is a pleasure to meet women who know their work and are not playing at art. It was not until the 1960s, uh, by the way, that women were finally admitted to the Art Workers Guild. Charles Robert Ashby, uh, another leading figure in the British arts and craft movement. He was very open about his admiration for Morris, as you can see from this pamphlet here. Um, full of idealism, Ashby uh, sets up a school, the School of Handicraft, in the East End of London, which was then a very poor area. Uh, and um, from that moves on to set up the Guild of Handicraft, which is bas based at Essex House, which was in Mile End in London. And you can see the house in, in the illustration here. Um, I really like, <laughs> there's a bit anecdotal, but um, Ashby uh, is such a huge fan <laughs> of Morris um, that he tries to convince him, you know, says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm creating this school of handicraft. I'm creating a weapon for you in the fight against this social injustice. And poor Ashby, because Morris is very much like, well, you know, that weapon is going to be too small to make any difference. Um, Morris as with any of these things, believes that this, you know, complete overthrow is necessary and anything that's smaller, he's less interested in. But Ashby per perseveres. He sets up his schools. And what's really great about this story uh, is that um, in, uh, when is it? In 1902, uh, when the lease runs out, uh, Ashby has in his head that it would, wouldn't it be great to, to live in the countryside and have this rural ideal and a set of workshops. But then he convinces about, you know, all, all the people who work for him in the Guild of Handicraft to come with him. And about 150 people move from the east end of London to this tiny little village in the Cotswolds where they set up a workshop. Now, artists may have found inspiration in Morris, but that doesn't mean they slavishly copied him. And with so many different craftspeople across the country, there are big variations in their methods and in their designs. This is uh, an example of uh, the work by the designer W.A.S. Benson. Um, and he embraced mechanical production. In his London studio, he designed for metal uh, and in including a range of electric light fittings uh, and turned by machine. But in contrast, the furniture maker, Sidney Barnsley, worked in the Cotswolds, believed that it was wrong uh, to delegate any aspect of his craft. And he goes so far as to insist that he even needs to make the packing crates for his furniture. 
One of Morris's principles was that the most satisfying and the highest quality of work would be achieved if the same person who designed an object also made it. But as we've seen, even in Morris's own workshop, uh, and you know, things were often designed and made by different people, including stained glass. Christopher Wall began designing stained glass in 1879 on, on the on that same principle, but he became really frustrated with the way his designs were interpreted by the firm making the stained glass. So he sets out and learns and, uh, and becomes a true designer and maker on stained glass, setting a new standard. And this is an example of his work. Now, many of those involved in the arts and crafts movement set up workshops in rural areas and they revive old techniques, uh, which is perfectly illustrated in this photograph of Stonywell, the arts and crafts home designed by Ernest Gimson. Um, the arts and crafts makers, never mind the, you know, the way in which their approach varied, they were united by the following principles in their design. Truth to materials, preserving and emphasizing the natural qualities of the material, simple forms, so no extravagant decoration and the actual construction of the object was often exposed. Natural motifs, inspired by the flora and fauna of the countryside. And the vernacular, the domestic traditions of the British countryside, providing the main inspiration for the arts and crafts movement. So I hope I've shown that Morris introduced a new and instantly recognizable aesthetic into British interiors, and his designs have been continuously produced ever since. He worked against the whole of the decorative arts, furniture, stained glass, ceramics, wallpapers, textiles, and the book arts. He was a practical reformer who pioneered new approaches to manufacture. And not content with transforming the decorative arts, made Morris also became a socialist and tried to transform society itself. His lectures and ideas on design and craftsmanship directly inspired the arts and crafts movement, and the next generation of artists and makers took inspiration from Morris's ideas, and like him, they were reacting against the industrialization of the age. But they adapt his ideas in various ways, expanded into other arts such as garden design, jewellery, and their responses range from con conservative to radical, from urban to country, and they from embracing to reject rejecting new technology. And the issues that Morris and the arts and craft movement cared about, you know, equality, sustainability, uh, our relationship with technology and the role of art in society, we still are discussing these. We still haven't quite figured these out. And that's what I feel Morris's experience and his ideas continue to be relevant in the 21st century. Thank you.